I'm going to invite you to go with me to Psalm chapter 67. Today we're going to look at a missionary psalm that looks forward to the rule of Yahweh as king over Jews and over Gentiles. Paul the Apostle agonized over the lost condition, the blindness of his Israelite countrymen in Romans 9, 10, and 11. He even comes to the point and he says, if I could, if I could forego my own salvation that my countrymen could be saved, I would do it. But we know that's not how anyone is saved. You must come by faith, through grace, repenting of your sins, and trust in Christ alone. As disciples of the Lord Jesus, we ought to be saturated with the Bible. We ought to be those kind of people whose lives are characterized by holiness and a zeal for all to come to a saving knowledge of the truth. With William Carey, we say we expect great things from God and we will attempt great things for God. We have a divine invitation to everlasting joy. That's what makes Psalm 67 a missionary psalm. It was sung by the psalmist and it was responded by the people as they would sing this to God. A prayer, a doxology, praise to God. Psalm 67, you follow along in your copy of the scriptures. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth, Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. And all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Father, we ask you once again for help. As we have heard from heaven, we have heard your very words. So I'm asking you, Lord, to use me as your minister to minister grace to the hearers. I'm asking you, Lord, for the hearers, for all who are listening this morning, that they would hear what you, by your spirit, would say to the church. If there is a person here without Christ today, may today be the day where they repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone and find forgiveness and mercy and life. We thank you for this invitation. For Jesus' sake, amen. As a church, our purpose is to glorify God. It is our overarching purpose. We exist to glorify God. And if we're going to glorify God, if you and I are going to live lives that glorify God, then right out of the gate, we're going to seek to reach people for Jesus Christ. Evangelism. We're going to seek to other people come to know Christ as Savior. And when they do come to faith in Christ, we want to see them connected in the body of Christ, to become members, to join. Then they, they're equipped to grow in their faith. How do we equip? Through the teaching of the Word through home Bible fellowships, through Sunday school classes, through the preaching of God's word. That's how you're equipped to grow in your faith. And as you're equipped, then you will inevitably, if you belong to God and you want to glorify God, then you will serve him. You will spend your life for the greatness of your king. So we know, maybe you're new with us this morning, maybe you recently joined in with us, but our people know because we've been taught by the word of God that we have been born for such a time as this. Every person that I'm looking at right here, right now, every aspect of your life, God has ordained for right here, right now. You were not born in the wrong generation. You weren't born in the wrong decade. You weren't born in the, you know, this is the wrong style for me. This is exactly the moment that God intended for you to be alive for your good, for his glory. 
So we know we are here, just like Esther, for such a time as this. And from the message last Sunday, this building on the Great Commission, we are all commanded to make disciples. Go and make disciples, baptizing and teaching them to obey all things that I have commanded you. That's a full assignment. So here we go back to Psalm 67. We're in the Old Testament and we see God's heart is a missionary heart. His heart for the peoples of the earth. Psalm 67 echoes the covenant that God made with Abraham that God promised. God covenanted with Abraham, I will bless you. I will bless your descendants. I will bless the whole world through you. And that line was traced from Abraham down to Isaac. Isaac down to Jacob and Esau was rejected and Ishmael was rejected. This is the line of promise and through the line of promise came Jesus and we have been blessed. Amen? We have been given a savior and we have sung of this savior this morning and we will make much of him from this day forward as God enables us. Now, the Bible has much to say about joy, right? So you see the title of the message, right? This, this, is, this is world missions. This is global missions. This is God's great invitation to joy. And when you are, you know, we got a good old days, uh, good old days booth coming up. We went out inviting. Remember, you were challenged. Reach 10 people in your community. And sometimes I'm afraid we can hear like, oh, man, you know, the pastor, he's just trying to wrangle me into doing something. And I'm nervous and I don't really like to talk to people. And what's he what's he he's setting me up for failure. That's what he's doing. Somebody's going to slam the door on me. or I'm going to lose a friend and I'm going to blame him. That's his fault. I want you to understand biblically when we are sharing the gospel, this is what we're doing. We're inviting the nations to joy. And we're going to see this joy described in Scripture this morning. I mean, how hard would it be if you had all access to the governor's mansion on Mackinac Island, all expenses paid? How hard would you have to work to fill a bus to go there? I mean, seriously. And that thing will leak and they have to fix the roof and the plumbing will have to be maintenance and the yard will have to be maintenance. We're talking about God's everlasting invitation to joy. God. Mackinac, God, right? And I guarantee you, if I told you the message came in, the governor is, here it is, fill a bus, you wouldn't have a bit of problem having that thing full in about an hour. So I want us to think of this. The Bible has much to say about joy. John 17, 13, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, Jesus prayed for his own that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Well, when is Jesus praying? And we're going to look at this tonight when we gather for communion. The high priestly prayer. This is before Jesus lays down his life. He's talking about joy. His prayer to his father is, I want my disciples to have my joy fulfilled in them. I want them to understand it. I want them to know it. I want them to experience my joy. Jesus' desire for us is that our joy may be full, John 15, 11. Joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22. James writes, and when we go through suffering, when we go through trials, all kinds of trials, James 1, 2, to count it all joy. Okay, is that, is that your perspective? When you go through trials? Well, pastor, you don't know about this trial. Um, does it fit under the terminology or the heading of various trials? What does various mean? All kinds. Oh, yeah, it does. Count it all joy because God is working for your good and for his glory. So count it all joy. Peter wrote about the believer's constant joy, even in the midst of trials. First Peter 4, 12 and 13. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Okay, so if you're living for God, you're doing what's right, and a trial comes, do you think, where, where'd that come from? What did I do to deserve that? Some of you have seen this news story of this family, this missionary family on their way to Japan, and this week was struck by the semi-truck somewhere, I think, in Nebraska, and they went into eternity out of John Piper's church. 
This is what this is what I'm calling for. I'm expecting God will raise up families and say, Pastor, we will go, we will move, we will go to difficult countries. I'm expecting that to happen, but you never expect that that family on their way to final training in the Denver area to go to Japan and their lives are ended when a truck doesn't stop because the driver is distracted. How is that part of God's plan? Well, I can't give you that answer, but I can tell you this, it is. It is part of God's plan. And he's the only one that can bring beauty from ashes. He's the only one. So we pray with that church family and those family members that their hearts are torn up. It doesn't, it doesn't make our suffering, we don't treat it in a nonchalant manner. It doesn't mean that when you suffer, it's no big deal to God. It is. But know that he is working in your trials. And Peter says, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Think about this. The Olympics have opened up, the scenes, the, the countries come in, and this is the country, and the people cheer, and the, they're waiting, all this, all that joy. We will come with Christ. We will be under his banner. This day is coming. And we'll be with him. So Peter says, lift your eyes up. Keep your eyes on Jesus. There's a day of exceeding joy. And we'll look back and see how all of this mess, all of the accidents and the illness and the, even our own sin, how God works that all together for good to those who love him, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Go with me. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12. And when Jesus was teaching, he said this about the day that we anticipate to hear our master say, Matthew 25, 21, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you rule over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord, of your Lord. Enter into the joy. Think about that. Do you live life thinking of that day? Enter into the joy of your Lord. We're encouraged to run our race. Hebrews chapter 12 follows Hebrews 11, the hall of fame chapter of all those who have gone before us. Chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily ensnare us. So week after week after week after week, message after message after message, my prayer for you, that you lay aside the weight. You lay aside the sin. That you run with patience the race that is set before you. I cannot run your race and you cannot run my race. I can't run the race for my children, for my wife. You cannot run the race for your family. You have to run your race. But you must run. And you cannot run. You know, I don't recommend you wearing the shorts that they wear when they run in these races. A <laughs> little, little strange there, but what are their, what's their goal? I want to wear as least amount as possible. <laughs> oh, help us, right? Turn away. Okay, but this is the idea. Runners understand. They're not, when they get to the race, they're not wearing the weight vest because I'm just going to really, you know, work on my... No, I want to win. So they're shedding everything that they don't need. Swimmers, they shave, right? They're completely bald. Why? Because hair will slow you down in the water. I think that's my problem. Hair just slows me down. That's why I'm a slow swimmer. I don't know. But what does he say? Lay aside. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Where do we fix our eyes? Verse 2 tells us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. Okay, that's back to Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. All authority is given to me that we looked at last Lord's Day. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Who for the, what's the word? Joy that was set before him endured the cross. Are you kidding me? Despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So our example is Jesus. And for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. 
And he triumphed over all of the shame and all of the pain and the separation from his father on our account for his glory to vindicate his name and his righteous character. So we go back to Psalm 67. My aim, okay, why are we here today? All right, to glorify God, yes. Why am I preaching and why don't we just sing the last song and let's just go and, and get to lunch a little sooner? Why? Because I have an aim. I have a target. It's for every age. It's for every person. So I want you to buckle in. I want you to get your pen out. And I want you to, this is the point of your life. Whether you know it or not, this is why you're breathing right now. So the question isn't, well, what is my purpose? The question is, are you living for the purpose for which God has created you? That's the question you have to ask and answer. I have an aim that we will all grasp the truth that world missions is God's great invitation to everlasting joy. God will accomplish his sovereign plan of redemption. He, he will use a called people with a divine purpose who are equipped with a certain promise. It all begins and ends with God. So basically, I'm going to divide this psalm up into three sections. Number one, God will accomplish his plan of divine redemption through God's people. That's number one, God's people. A called people. We are his own people. This is his people. We're his Psalm 67 verse 1 begins where we, if, we, if you're here and you know Christ, this is where it began with God showing you mercy. It wasn't with, yeah, well, you know, my dad was a pastor. And so the Lord looked on me and said, wow, that guy's pretty straight. You know, look, he keeps a nice haircut and wears a tie. No. God's mercy. Well, you know, I was, I was going to church and I started doing some things and I, I, I did some other things and I started cleaning my life up, get my things all in order and then, you know, God... No. It all begins with God's mercy for us as God's people. God, be merciful to us. God's people are characterized by mercy. We're those who have been forgiven. Mercy implies an acknowledgement of guilt. If you have a convicted lawbreaker standing before a judge and he says, Judge, have mercy on me. He's saying, I'm guilty. I did it. You don't say, I have mercy on me if you didn't do it. You're saying, you don't understand. I didn't do it. You're not pleading for mercy unless you're saying, I'm guilty. We're all guilty before God. We have all sinned, Romans 3.23 says. So if we get as sinners what we deserve, we get hell. We get the separation from God for all eternity. It's hell to pay. The wages of sin is death. Now, I would venture to say that there's not many people today who are going to lose much sleep over the truth that God shows mercy to sinners. When was the last time someone stopped you where you work? And they say, excuse me, I have a question. I'm just amazed. You're telling me that God forgave you? God showed you mercy? How can he do that and be holy? I mean, when was the last time someone asked you that question? Most people are oblivious to this. That God shows mercy. If someone murdered my child and then said, I'm sorry, to the judge. And the judge said, oh, okay, Mr. Wise, uh, he said he's sorry. You can go free. Then that judge has just made my child's life worth nothing. And yet this is what God does for us every day. When a sinner turns to the Lord, that's what God is doing. On the basis of Christ's death, I forgive you. You're justified. This is what God does for us. Many people get upset with God when he fails to bless them with health, with long life, with prosperity, with family, with good job. They say, well, God, where is God? And if God is good, then how can he let these bad things happen to, quote, good people, unquote? You've probably heard that at work. But no one says I just don't get it. How can a holy God say, I forgive you to me, a sinner? A, a rebellious, treasonous wretch. That's just been keeping me awake at night. I don't know how he can do it. And his character remain intact. 
When God shows mercy to sinful man, this is at the foundation of us understanding missions. It is not for man. It is for God. When God shows mercy, it's God-centeredness. It's not man-centeredness. God is doing it for his own glory. That we see through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He rejected Ishmael. He rejected Esau. This is his plan. It's for his own glory that he would show mercy. The Son of God was slain so that the righteousness of God could be upheld and rebellious sinners who repent might be justified. Because God cannot forgive a sinner. And just because you said, I'm sorry, okay, we'll, we'll just let it go. No, you can't let it go. Someone has to die the death. And that's Jesus. Romans 3.26, Paul says, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he, God, might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. He's just. His holiness, his righteousness, his character is intact. And he justifies. Well, how can he do that? He had to come in Christ and die and be raised to life. Forgiveness is when the debt is assumed by someone else so that the offender can be set free. The debt just doesn't disappear. Go back to the courtroom. If the guy says, I'm sorry, my, my, my kid wouldn't just automatically come back to life. Oh, no, problem's over because he said I'm sorry. No, this is, this is someone's going to take the loss here. That's Jesus. That's what he has done for sinners who will trust in him. We're characterized by mercy as God's children, as God's people. And then in Psalm 67, 1, it says, be merciful to us and bless us. God's people are characterized by blessing. We've already been blessed in Christ far beyond what we deserve. And can you admit to that? That you have been blessed by God way, way beyond imaginable of what we deserve. And yet, we stand today. Are, do you need God's blessing today? Yes. So it is one thing, and we're called to bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, forget not all his benefits. We're to bless him, and that's important. But I'm not adding anything to him when I bless him. Now let's flip that around. When he blesses me, oh, oh he's adding to me, all right. When he blesses us, that's a whole different ball game than when we're blessing him. So here the psalmist says, have mercy on us and bless us. And then we see favor. We're characterized by mercy. We're characterized as God's people by blessing. We're characterized by favor. And the psalmist says, and cause his face to shine upon us. Remember back to King Ahasuerus. Esther says, fast and pray for me. We're in our last week of our fast this week. Culminates on Saturday. And so they fasted and she went in and she was watching the king. What's the king's face going to be when he sees me? What's going to, what his face is going to tell my life or my death? And they see his face and he sees Esther and it lights up. Oh, it's Esther. Okay, she's not going to die today. Guy can put away his sword over here on the side. The king's going to be all right. Dips the scepter, come on in. And... Furthermore, what do you want? Up to half the kingdom. Okay, that's favor. His face to shine on her, which is very different when Esther unfolds that plot with Haman there at the banquets. And then the king is indignant and he says, who's done this? And she says, the wicked Haman. His face wasn't the same face that she saw. His face is written all over. This guy's going to die. This guy is in trouble. This guy deceived me. He's trying to kill my king, my queen, and her people. Very different in the faces of the same king. In number six, and in verses 22 down through 27, but in verse 25, we see this connection of Psalm 67. The priests were given a responsibility from God to bless the children of Israel. Number six, 22, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his son saying, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say this to them. It's through a word. Okay? It's through a prayer of blessing over them. Verse 24, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you 
and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. This is God's plan for blessing. And someone else might say, well, how selfish does the Lord, he was needy, and so he got these people, these are my people, you know, like we're kids playing on a playground. These are mine, my toys. I was here first. Is that what God is doing here with his people? No. This is his heart for missions. You're my people, and you're going to set my name on them. They're going to walk out into life, into this world, and people are going to say, Wow, something different about you. Who's your God? Because your God isn't like our God. I want to know who your God is. They were called to be missionaries to the world, and they got that thing turned upside down. They were like, we're his people. We're the chosen people. To bless the world. Oh, we just missed that part. Now, in the New Testament... We're reminded by Paul about the glory of the Lord that shone upon Moses' face. Moses covered his face. He bent with the Lord and we came down his face. They couldn't even look at him. Like, Moses, we can't look at you. Put a bag on your face. Cover your face up. And 2 Corinthians 3, 16, it talks about they, they did this so that the children would not see the fading glory. They wouldn't see the glory departing from Moses' face because it wasn't intrinsic. Intrinsic is from inside. Okay, so if you have a judge, extrinsic, you put a robe on him, put him behind a desk, he's a judge, he's in charge. You put him in a car and he's drunk, he's, he's in trouble, okay, because he's broken the law. God's holiness is intrinsic. Moses comes down and God's holiness is, shine, is shown on him and his face is just glowing. So they cover him. Second Corinthians 4, Paul described the unbeliever is blind to the truth and the reality of Jesus Christ and his gospel. They're blinded. The God of this age has blinded them. So when you think about someone who's blind and you think about them going to the edge of the cliff, would you get mad at them? Would you call them names? You know, hey, dummy, you're going to the cliff. You can see them with the stick and they can't see. No, you wouldn't get mad at them. You would run to them and say, hell, hey, you got you to come back. I'll help you. Stay away from the cliff. There's a cliff coming, and I know you can't see it, but here, no, 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 don't, don't go that way. Oh, I've been this way before. No, you can't see it. Come back. You would risk everything to save their life. You wouldn't get mad at them. So think about the non-believing co-workers and neighbors and family members you have. Getting mad at them is not going to help. Calling them names and thinking them stupid you just can't see it. It's because they're blind. You wouldn't get mad at a physically blind person. Don't get mad at a spiritually blind person. Pray for them. Keep sharing the gospel with them. Keep living a Christ-like example before them. We preach Christ. God opens blind eyes. They can't see. You see Jesus and they see somebody who's just a great prophet or some guy in the past. They don't see an all-glorious God in flesh. But one day, by God's grace, their eyes will be opened and they'll see the beauty of Christ. The veil still remains over most of the Israelite people to this day. They read the Old Testament. It's all about Jesus and they can't see. They can't see. They're blinded. It's like the veil is over their eyes and they can't see Jesus. C.H. Spurgeon said repentance and faith are the two, thing, the two wings that fly us to the Savior. So our kids are gonna, and our family are going to get on that plane in Germany, fly back tomorrow. They're going to need two, two wings, okay? They can't fly with one wing. They have to have two. So it is with coming to faith in Christ, repentance and faith. You have to have both. How many people have told you, oh, I believe in God? Yeah, has there been Repentance. Have you understood your own sinfulness? Have you understood what God owes you? Repentance and faith, the two wings that fly us to the Savior. Only in Christ is this veil removed by grace through faith. Romans 5, verse 5, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. How does that happen? You know what? That's how God saves. We hear the gospel and God regenerates the heart. Then the psalmist says, Selah. Stop and think about that. Stop the music. 
Do you understand what you just read? We, we, we sat here this morning. Now think about this. You have heard a message in the last 20 minutes that there are people, there are billions of people who have never heard that message. They don't know that there's a God who will show them mercy. And is it easy for us to become complacent with that? And wonder, you know, it's the Lord's Day. Maybe I'll go to church today. Maybe I'm, eh, I'm pretty busy. Got some things, whatever. This message, there are billions of people who are dying and they've never heard this message. Selah. Stop and think about that. If you are one of God's people, then he owns us. He owns us. He has a plan for us. And that's the second thing we see in this psalm. He has a plan, God's plan. God's people, God's plan. Third thing is God's promise. We'll get to that in a minute. God's plan. Verses two through five. This is his plan for his people. We're to live for a divine purpose. Verse two, that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Selah. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We exist to know Christ and to make him known. And verse 2 says, that your way may be known on earth. Doesn't this sound a little bit like our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, there's no question of the glory of God. It's held in question on earth by God's created people, by God's created beings. So how are they going to hear of the way of God? How are they going to hear that Jesus is the way, John 14, 6? There is a way. There is a way that seems right to a man. The end of that way is death. There is another way. There's God's way. And his way to be known on earth, then they have to be preached to. The gospel has to be proclaimed to them, Acts 4.12. There's no other name that saves. It's only Jesus. Someone has to go, Romans 10. Who's going to go take the message? How are they going to hear without a preacher? How are they going to preach unless they're sent? All of these things come together in the Great Commission and God's call to everlasting joy. We exist for the spread of the gospel to all peoples. That's why I used that allegory last week of the life-saving station. It's so easy for us to get caught up into what we want, my plans, my wishes, and lose sight of God's using us for the world for his glory. We exist for the spread of the gospel to all peoples. Verse 3 says, he calls us to praise God. The good news is for the joy of all peoples. All these people groups, all these different language groups. We as sinners cannot get to God on our own, so he came to us. He came to us. All this so fitting. These athletes in, in Rio, they're exercising all they have denied their bodies and gone through and brutal training for a temporal crown. And we are laboring and living for an eternal crown. Why is the gospel good news for all peoples? Verse 4. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Selah. God relates to his creation and to his world and the nature of his rule is directly related to his wonderful character. So as we relate to the world, we are showing the character of God to people. The description of this joy is found in Psalm 16, verse 11. That's the question we should ask. Well, why, why is this good news? You know, aren't, the, aren't those who are worshiping after Muhammad and Islam, aren't they okay? I mean, they're worshiping. All the people who follow after Joseph Smith and, you know, and Mormonism, aren't, aren't they okay? I mean, they're, they're content. I mean, if I, if I talk to them, Jehovah's Witnesses, wow, you know, that can really get going. So all right, just live and let live. No, that's not, that's not Bible. That's a way that seems right to a man. 
But if you go back to Psalm 16, verse 11, in Psalm 16, 11, we see the joy described that we're talking about here. The psalmist says, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is what kind of joy? Fullness of joy. Overflowing joy. Way past the top. At your right hand are pleasures, how long? Forevermore. Never-ending joy. We're talking about fullness of joy, and at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. So you start thinking about all of the things that, that make you happy, that bring you pleasure. How long do those things last? Did you wake up out of bed this morning that your kid won the tournament 17 years ago? Yeah! No. That's what you said when they won and they all walked out the field and then you went to paying the bills for all your tournament travel. Okay? Joy went right out the window. There's a trophy somewhere getting dusty. Sex? Pleasure forevermore? No. Eating a meal that was just unbelievable. Yeah. How long does that pleasure last? Well, that was yesterday and I'm kind of hungry. My stomach is growling now. Hope this guy hurries and finishes up because I'm ready to go eat. Okay, Why? God has worked us in such a way that all of our pleasure here on earth, it's short-lived. It's here and it's gone. And as we see in the case of the family traveling to Colorado, if, if that's where their joy is, it can be taken away. You can lose it. What we're describing here, this invitation from God to the world is for an everlasting joy that you cannot top. There's nothing better. The world has nothing better to offer you than what God is offering here. And it cost him the life of his son. How precious is this? Hebrews 11, 25 and 26 is where Moses had that choice to make. He was in Egypt. He was in the royal palace. And is he going to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin? See, the Bible doesn't lie. There is pleasure in sin. It's fun for a while, but there are other seasons. And what you sow, you reap. You reap according to what you sow. You reap later than you sow. You reap more than you sow. And so Moses said, you know what? I'm not going to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin in Egypt. I'm going to suffer with the people of God. Choosing Christ, Hebrews 11 tells us. The Westminster Confession asked the question right out of the gate. What is the chief end of man? And the answer is this, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. So if someone doesn't know that that is the chief end of man, they are missing their whole point of living. Now that's a tragedy. There's no greater tragedy than to live and die and not know that God made you to glorify Him and to enjoy Him forever and ever and ever. And so hell is the answer to the unbeliever's request to not have God. I don't want God. Hell matches the glory of heaven is contrasted with the awfulness and the punishment of hell. And heaven is everlasting and the contrast is hell is everlasting. Does this break our hearts? Does this move us at all? Does this impact our affections, our plans? Why? Why is this joy cause for gladness back in Psalm 67? Because the Lord Jesus will judge the people righteously. So let me ask you, do you ever get tired of the political scene and corruption? Doesn't it get old after a while of hearing one news story after another, after another of corruption and wrongdoing and lying and deception and all? It's, just, it's a never-ending cycle. Well, what's the answer to that? that? That would be Jesus. Do you ever get tired of seeing the news things come across your phone or watch TV and another shooting and a drive-by and a jogger in Oakland County is found on someone's lawn and on and on and on it goes? Do you ever get tired of that? Does that get old of crime and murder and injustice? Okay, well, what's the answer to that? It's right here. It's Jesus. You, Lord, you will judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Guess what? That's good. That's good for the people because he's righteous. He's not corrupt. So Paul proclaimed in Athens, 
Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. By the man whom he has ordained, he has given us assurance to this all by raising him from the dead. Jesus Christ, all the judgment has been committed to Christ and he will judge righteously. There will not be one person stand and say, well, Jesus, you don't know what I went through. He still bears the marks of his crucifixion in his body. Revelation says he still, as, in Revelation 5, as a lamb who had been slain. No one will look at him and say, they will bow. Psalm 76 says that even the wrath of man will praise you. The Lord Jesus will govern all nations on earth. It's a look forward to the millennial reign of Christ on the earth and his eternal rule. We sing the Christmas carol, joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. It talks about the barrenness and the earth and the curse being reversed. That's all in that hymn. Listen to that carol and think about Psalm 67 when uh, they start playing that in a couple months <laughs> on the radio of your station of your choice, all right? And once again, he says, Selah, Stop the music and think about that. And then let's take it up a notch. Verse 5. Let's hit it again. Praise to God. Well, didn't we just have... I think the pastor just went through that verse in verse 3. You know, we were singing that song uh, earlier this morning. We repeated that line. Why? Because there's times when we will sing something and we won't really get it. So it needs to settle in like a soaking rain. That we need to praise God. Let the peoples praise you, O oh God. Let all the peoples praise you. This is a prophetic look to the future when praise to God will resound from all peoples. Psalm 22, 27, and 28. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. This, this makes us think of Philippians 2, that he has been exalted and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But for those who die not confessing that, it's too late for them. So we have to reorient our lives, church, to be the vessels, to be the, the conduit of the gospel to the nations, to the peoples. We start here and we don't stop until everyone has heard the gospel. This is consuming of our lives. Let all the people join in. It's an invitation and it's a proclamation. It's an invitation and it's also a prophecy. This is going to happen. This is going to take place. Now, when we think about this, the question might come up from someone, I hear God needing praise. Is he egotistical? If I'm standing before you saying, um, I've gathered you today to praise me, that doesn't sound right, because it's not. Right? When I get out of bed, I have to take my breath and get situated and snap everything into place and get out of bed. Like, I'm not worthy of praise. I can't forgive anyone's sins. I'm not God. I can't speak and planets come out of my mouth. I'm not God. I'm not worthy of praise. And all the athletes, they run their course, and they live their cycle, and they set records, and then someone else comes along. So is God egotistical to call men to praise him? God's glory is the greatest, and our ultimate joy is found in enjoying his greatness. In his greatness, we find the very reason for our existence. Perhaps if someone questions this, they, if they don't believe that God is worthy of all praise, who do they believe is worthy of all praise? Them? You? Are you worthy of all praise? C.S. Lewis writes in his book, Reflections on the Psalms, he struggled before coming to faith in Christ with this very thing. Psalm after psalm after psalm, calling for the praise of people, dealing with, what is this? And he describes it this way. He says, the miserable idea that God should in any sense need or crave for our worship. And he compares it to like a vain woman wanting compliments. That was before he came to know Christ. That's how he was, who is this calling for people to praise me, praise me, praise me? That's annoying until you understand why, why is God worthy of this praise. He writes, 
after he comes to faith in Christ, the veil is taken off. He says the psalmist, it, the psalmist, in telling everyone to praise God, are doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. Nobody has to tell you, hey, um, your kid just threw, you know, won the, the tournament. Can you tell people about that? Um, I heard you just had a new grandbaby. Can you please try to talk about that little grandbaby? Okay, no one has to tell you to do that. That's what he's saying. That's what you want to do because that's what you care about. My whole, more general, difficulty about the praise of God depended on my absurdly denying to us as regards to the supremely valuable what we delight to do what indeed we can't help doing about everything else we value. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. It is, it, it is its appointed consummation. It is not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another, one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. I mean, think about it. You want to sit there and watch fireworks by yourself? Ooh! Ah! I'm going to bed. Right? What's the point of this? If you can't share it with somebody. Ginger and I will celebrate 21 years this week of marriage. If I was to get her a gift, get her some flowers, get her something, and she says, oh, thanks. You, know, you didn't have to do this. Well, why'd you do this? If my answer to her is, well, you know, it's our anniversary. It was my duty. That's not going to sit well. That's not going to be like, whoa, be still my heart. Wow. That's amazing. But if I respond to her, because there's nothing better I wanted to do, than to get you this, show my love for you. Do you think she's going to say, that is so self-centered. That You're just doing this for you? No, I just want to show you I love you. I wanted to do this. And it works out in expressing love. That's what the psalmist is calling us to do. It's what we were born to do. It's what we're meant to do. And if we don't worship and praise the Lord, if we don't glorify Him, we will not enjoy Him forever. We will miss it and our eyes will be blinded and the nations will never hear that God is merciful and He saves, He pardons sinners. Thirdly, God's promise. God's called people live for a divine purpose with a guaranteed promise. And we see this in verses 6 and 7. And here we see stemming all the way back from the garden where the curse and man sinned. And we see the reversal of the curse. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. And all the ends of the earth shall fear him. It's a fruitful earth. It's an earth that doesn't look like my yard right now. Oh, crispy. This is a fruitful earth. This is where the second Adam redeems us from the curse from our father Adam. The blessing of God and the universal fear of the Lord is what it's here. People who fear him. This is where life, this is where true wisdom abounds. This is where we know our God. We know why we've been made. God's called people living for a divine purpose with a guaranteed promise that God in Christ through his people is offering the greatest invitation to joy. He's willing to pardon sinners. He provided Jesus as the payment for our rebellion against him. He's willing to drop all charges against you if you will simply plead the blood of Jesus and he will say, forgiven, paid in full. He doesn't have to go to hell. He doesn't have to pay for his sin because my son Jesus paid for it. That's the great exchange. So then what? Go with me to Hebrews chapter 13. And here we will draw our time to a close. For this morning, Hebrews 13. So then what? We are God's people. We have a purpose. We have God's plan. We have God's promise. So what are we supposed to do with this? How does this change us? 
The writer of Hebrews brings this sermon all the way down to, a, to their fours here that we're going to look at. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. Therefore, Jesus also. He just got done talking about all of the bodies, the dead animals taken outside of the camp, and there they were burned. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, go to him. Risk it all. Go to him. There's suffering out there. That's where Jesus was crucified. But that's where he is. Go where the nations haven't heard the gospel. Go there. Don't play and live safe, happy American dream lives and waste it. Go. Give. We're either going or we're sending. There's no middle ground. We're inviting. We have the greatest message ever given to man. Inviting men and women and young people to the greatest joy, an everlasting joy. So let's think about this. Let's pray about this. How will God use the suffering and trials in my life right now to allow me to invite others around me to this greatest joy? Are you really asking to get out of the problem you're in? If I could just get past this, then it'll be okay. Hey, hang on a second. God's working for your good and for his glory. Stop trying to get out of the trial. Stop trying to get past the trial, past the difficulty, past. If I can just get done with this. Uh, if God's the one allowing that, then let him use it in you for his glory and for your good. And for our good as a church. How can we intensify our efforts at getting the gospel to all peoples? What mission partnerships are reaching the hard-to-reach, unreached groups? What are we doing to be able to go? That's connected with our giving, church. That's connected with our reaching people and them remaining committed and loyal followers of Jesus plugged into the body of Christ. And they're putting their resources and their lives into the work of the gospel and not faltering and falling away. It's all connected. Together, may we all say with Isaiah, here am I, send me, I'll go, use me. Wherever you go tomorrow, let God use you because there's people all around you and they are not ready to die. They are not ready to stand before this God. They are not living, their lives are not characterized by joy. And you know Christ if you're here and you've trusted in him. So let God use you to invite people to the greatest joy, that is world missions. And it's from here on the corner of this street to the other side of this planet. Will you stand with me? Father, as we close our time in prayer, before we sing of your love, I lift up to you our mission partnerships. Lord, we pray for Irfan Abdul Latif. Father, his health is failing him right now. He's in a lot of pain. So Father, I pray that you will help him to be a good steward and I pray that you'll strengthen him and I pray that you will give him just um, the health that he needs to continue on in, the, in this unique service that he is able to offer with which most of us cannot, but we can send him and we can pray for him and we will be glad to hear from him in a couple weeks. Lord, we pray for Harrison and Michelle Banda. We pray that you will bless them. We pray, pray, God, that their ministry will be effective in discipleship and making disciples and reaching in Zambia, God, far reaching. Help Harrison as he serves with the young men there and Michelle as she labors with the women. And they do this together for the glory of Jesus. We pray for them. God, we pray for Mike and Chris Furtaw. And the intern, the intermittent trips that they take, God, and for how you will use them in the years to come and what their role here is in this church. 
pray for them. Lord, I pray for Richard. I pray for Julia. I pray for Ken and for Jenna Rudolph and our team that is with Richard and Julia right now. I pray, God, that there will be a great harvest come from this investment. Both in the lives of the German people and in the precious lives of our young people who have gone. I cannot wait, Lord, to next week and hear the testimonies and the goodness of God throughout this mission trip, Lord. I pray for Isaac and Gloria Shaw working in northern India in a very, very difficult land, and yet they keep advancing the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray for them. Meet their needs, Lord. We pray for Niku and Marta Sotir in Romania. Bless them. We're just beginning our partnership with them, Lord, just getting to know them. Father, we pray that you'll uphold them. I pray that you will send forth laborers into your harvest and that this church will be a forever sending church until Jesus returns. Father, that we will be a, just our whole attitude toward missions, both here and abroad, will be energized and exercised for the glory of our Savior Jesus. In whose name we pray.